Uh, all right, so about four years ago or so, I was having a conversation with another researcher. Um, at the time, he was a researcher at Rigetti Computing. And um, you know, we were both trying to hire people into the field. And uh, we were talking about like, you know, what is it that it seems like quantum computing could really use uh, in order to get a boost and you know, bring us closer to quantum advantage. Um, so you know, we, we agreed that it would be great if we could convince people from applied math to get more and more into quantum computing. Because they, they, you know, they know all these dirty little tricks to you know, improve things and make things work in um, both analytical and heuristic cases. Um, so yeah, the, the, you know, this, this workshop has been a testament to you know, how far we've come. You know, I think it was like maybe a year after that conversation that Lynn came on the scene. You know, applied mathematicians start starting to have some results in quantum computing. You know, D, Constantina, you know, all these people in the front row, I guess, you know, many of you out there, who in the last four years have been making great contributions to quantum computing. Um, so I'm looking forward to more conversations this week. Uh, to get this dialogue going between these communities. Um, so uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities in quantum computing for applied mathematicians to contribute. The goal of my talk will be to uh, ultimately outline a few of those. Um, but I should give one uh, word of caution. Uh, I, I believe that there are many very interesting math problems that you could try to solve within quantum computing. Um, and may, maybe some of you are familiar with the concept of nerd sniping. You know, you just get stuck on this very interesting problem, just spending you know, so much time trying to solve it, um, you know, even if it doesn't have so much impact. Um, so yeah, I am uh, hoping to convey you know, my perspective on what I believe are important problems to solve in quantum computing. Um, and yeah, personally, I've, uh, in order to stay focused, tried to picture this future moment of the first useful quantum computation. I don't think it's happened yet, um, but you know, at some point, company is repeatedly paying money to some quantum computing provider and they're solving problems that are helping that company's business. So that's what I might picture as useful. Um, and so I'm very interested in pushing uh, quantum computing towards that moment. Um, so that just personally, that's my uh, you know, kind of guide star in the kind of work that I'm doing. Um, OK, so that's a bias that I'll, uh, you know, uh, I'll admit to. Um, okay, so yeah, I want to tell you a bit about my story in, um, you know, where, uh, um, how my views on quantum computing have changed over the last four or five years um, in this pursuit for the first useful quantum computations. Um, okay, so some questions that might um, guide this work are, okay, when will that first useful quantum computation be performed? Um, say, in the area of quantum chemistry? You know, is this going to be five years? Is it going to be 10 years, 20 years from now? Uh, and what task will that quantum computer solve? We've heard a number of potential applications throughout the workshop. Um, you know, but one that people talk about quite often is the task of ground state energy estimation, which is a useful sub subroutine in quantum chemistry. So you know, will the first useful quantum computation be ground state energy estimation? Um, and what is really standing in our way of getting to that moment? OK, so some problems are that today's quantum computers have too few qubits, and that the operations uh, that they carry out are too error prone. Um, and both of these limit the number of operations that can be performed per circuit 
on the quantum computer. You know, and as a point of reference, um, a, I think this is probably an upcoming IBM device will have 433 physical qubits. So that's kind of where we're, where we're at today or in the near future. So um, one way to uh, reframe this question of you know, when will this uh, happen, what's standing in the way, is to ask a more quantitative question of how many operations per circuit will this first useful quantum computation need? Um, you know, I'm picturing that as devices are getting better, they're able to implement more and more operations per circuit. So it would be great if we could find some applications um, where the quantum computer is solving a classically intractable problem using very few operations per circuit. Okay, so I want to give some references for the, you know, quantitatively, the uh, answers to this question of how many operations per circuit um, might different approaches need. So one place to start is this um, algorithm that we've heard quite a bit about throughout the workshop, quantum phase estimation. Um, it can be used to solve the task of ground state energy estimation. And so you know, one of the early papers showing how you would use QPE for ground state energy estimation um, was this work by um, Alan, Peter Love. Um, actually, these folks were at Berkeley at the time. Um, and this quantum phase estimation, as we've seen, uh, involves a circuit like this. Um, okay, so you know, using many controlled U operations where you can picture that maybe this has like hundreds of logical qubits, hundreds of thousands. So it's a big quantum circuit. Um, how big? Well, some recent estimates coming from the Google group uh, predicted the quantum resources needed to solve a, you know, maybe you would call it a utility scale instance of ground state energy estimation. So what did they find? Uh, well, they predicted that using uh, their future superconducting qubits, um, it might take on the order of hundreds of hours of runtime. It would require on the order of a few million qubits, physical qubits. And each circuit that's run would require you know, 10 billion uh, physical operations. Uh, or no, sorry, 10, 10 billion logical operations. Um, and uh, you know, one of the uh, concepts that goes into this calculation is, well, you know, how many errors does each operation, are we willing to allow it to tolerate? Um, and, you know, they, uh, this like 10 billion can roughly be converted into picturing that every single logical operation can fail once in 100 billion. Um, so this is very far from what today's devices are able to do with their physical operations, which is like, you know, one error every hundred or thousand operations. Many orders of magnitude difference. Um, and so this really points to the need um, for uh, high, you know, high quality fault tolerant protocols in order to run um, this quantum algorithm for that instance. with the number of electrons. Um, so uh, in this particular case, you know, I think they're considering like a second quantization. Um, and so you know, the number, it's not so, so much the number of electrons, but more the you know, number of um, basis functions included in the uh, active space or the dimension of the active space after you truncated. Um, but yeah, you can, um, there's some other methods where the scaling really depends on the number of electrons. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that you know, roughly these costs tend to be um, uh, maybe linear with the number of um, you know, size of the active space, something like that. And I think these were considering active spaces that had on the order of 100, um, 100 dimensions. Did 
This, this number is assuming that you've perfectly prepared the ground state, um, which in some cases is, you know, would be a major assumption. Oh, um, so yeah, I really can't say much in this particular case, um, but I, I do think that the, um, you know, the size is like, um, you know, on the order of where some of the state-of-the-art classical methods start to fail. So it's like, okay, even if this problem wasn't, you know, directly uh, useful, it might be representative of some because it's at the threshold of where classical methods fail. Um, but also, you know, I think one challenge in quantum chemistry is it's hard, it's hard to pick, you know, one instance where you say, hey, if you give me the ground state energy of this molecule, you know, I'll be able to make a million dollars, right? It's like, in these cases, it's more like, you know, design where you're wanting to search over a space of many, many molecules. You don't necessarily, you know, know what they're going to be ahead of time. There's some, I don't know, high throughput screening process where the quantum computer enters and at some point. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's good to think of these as like representative of, you know, in the future, people might want to solve that problem. Um, you know, on many molecules of that size. Okay, good questions. Okay, so this is very far from uh, what today's devices are able to do. And so, you know, maybe a decade ago, the field, uh, you know, had a sense that this would be very expensive. And so there was a push to find um, ways to solve the same problem using much um, nearer term quantum computers. And so uh, this variational quantum eigensolver algorithm, a so-called near-term intermediate scale quantum algorithm, uh, was proposed. I think this was a decade ago. Um, and this is a way to use fewer resources in an attempt to solve this ground state energy estimation problem. Um, I'm not going to go into details about you know, how this works now. If people have some questions later, I'd be happy to talk about it. So how many resources would this require? What resources would this require? Oh, I, I want to point out, right. In the meantime, there have been a number of experimental demonstrations of small versions of uh, VQE. So what are the resources that this would require? Well, first, um, this is a uh, heuristic algorithm. Uh, there's a optimization, a classical optimization component where it's hard to predict how, you know, how long that will take, how many steps till convergence. It's also hard to predict if your search space even contains a sufficiently good approximation to the ground state. Um, but uh, one nice feature is that if you're encoding um, you know, the molecule into physical qubits, then the say, you know, if you're doing a, a second quantization um, encoding, the number of physical qubits would be the same as uh, the number of spin orbitals that are considered. And, you know, if we're being generous, we could imagine that the ONSATS circuit used in VQE, um, maybe it's a square circuit, you know, number of operations deep is the number of um, qubits there are, in which case there would be like 10,000 operations in this circuit. Um, and, you know, the, the hope is that VQE can be uh, fairly robust, so, um, you know, every circuit that's run can tolerate, um, and you know, basically you can expect there to be an error um, in each circuit on average. And there's you know, some error mitigation techniques that can hopefully make it work uh, despite those errors. And so this makes it a candidate uh, for being run with near-term hardware. Okay, so here's a diagram to picture um, where QPE versus VQE uh, lie, and to understand um, you know, what might be between them. So on the vertical axis, this is the number of operations per circuit. Um, you can think of this as like kind of the size of the quantum circuit. On the horizontal axis, this is um, the error rate per operation on the quantum circuit that the algorithm can tolerate. And so you know, we can imagine that there's a little progress bar um, that you know improving on the horizontal axis because it's really up to the hardware and the fault tolerant protocols that it runs to determine 
you know, how low can we crank down logical error rates? You know, maybe we can picture that you know, so far, this progress bar has increased a bit. Um, but how far would it have to go in order to implement um, QPE or VQE? So I think in order to you know, really run the VQE I was talking about on the previous slide, there's still a little bit of improvement that would need to happen. But in order to run QPE, um, the error rates would have to improve by many orders of magnitude. Okay. Um, parentheses, I should say that you know, the hope is that uh, you know, with fault tolerant protocols, you can actually very efficiently crank down error rates um, so that we can traverse through this line very rapidly um, once we can get devices sufficiently good. Um, okay, so right, the point is that this leaves a very large gap between um, you know, VQE and QPE. And uh, a question is like, well, okay, is VQE a good candidate for, um, you know, is it feasible to solve problems of utility scale? Sorry for the uh, green light. Uh, sorry, the green line. Um, is it with or without uh, error mitigation? So this is, uh, yeah, independent of error mitigation. Maybe you could think of the role of error mitigation is to, um, you know, push these points up here to the left. You know, allow the algorithm to tolerate more uh, error per operation. Okay. Sorry. I mean, yeah, Rolando. Sorry? This is current circuit. This is error rate per uh, operation. So picture like logical That's operation. Right. But, but there, I mean, the, the vertical axis is how many operations we need per each circuit. Yes, right? yeah, yeah. But we need many circuits. So um, what is your sure. error model here? Because, right? Uh, I mean, you might, you know, depending where you are in this curve, you might reliably simulate that particular sequence with some <coughs> small error. But now, you know, you have to take account to so many runs. Yeah. That's true. It's hard to read in that sense. So, okay, if I understand you're saying, like, what if there's an algorithm that requires many, uh, like, many circuits that have to be run, like VQE? Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, what, what's, the, what's the concern? I don't think it is kind of like a fair comparison between VQE and QP. This plot because QPE in principle gives you the whole energy for this problem with whatever number of digits you need. VQE, you need many, many runs. So when you put that point there, you know, it kind of gives the impression that VQE ah. is going to perform well, but you are missing the big thing, which is, you know, the number of repetitions where errors can accumulate and destroy you. So this is, okay, this is a very, this is a very impor important point, if I understand. So do not think of this axis as. Uh, a measure of the runtime of these algorithms. As Rolando is saying, VQE, for example, you would have to run this you know, circuit that has a few operations, therefore quick. You'd have to run this many, many times. Okay, so do not, yeah, do not think of this as like, you know, how long would it take to solve the algorithm? Um, yeah. This is more like, you know, this is valuable in order to uh, predict um, what the um, error per operation requirements are. The total number of operations must include the number of repetitions. The total no yeah, so you know, if you had a plot of total so number of operations. On, on the left side of this line, when you only consider one zero, it's not telling you that you are in a good place in terms of uh, you know, errors. You are not under control of any error, for BQE in particular. QPE, I think, is fine because it's giving you the whole output. Right, because you're like one single run of QP gives you the whole enough. Yeah. It means many, many runs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is only indicating, like you know, given the number of operations per circuit, translate that into you know, therefore how many error error you know what error rate per operation, and then that gives you a sense for you know what the hardware requirements are. But we'll we'll get uh, we'll get to this point. I, Maybe you could say in the next few slides, I'm hoping to drive this point that you're making home. Okay, so right, so um, you know, just by this plot, 
the fact that uh, the number of, or the error rate per operation is um, allowed to be fairly high for VQE makes it seem more promising for implementation on nearer term hardware. Um, but they want to take into account how many repetitions you need. Does this make VQE a practical um, algorithm for solving ground state energy estimation? Okay, so that's the question. Um, okay, so uh, we had the good fortune of having this long-term collaboration with uh, BP, started back in 2019. Uh, there are a number of quantum chemists and material scientists at Zapata who are closely collaborating with uh, quantum chemists at BP. Um, and they set out to you know, basically answer this question that, uh, you know, in a sense, Rolando's bringing up, which is, for a set of industry-relevant molecules, would VQE be able to estimate ground state energy to within chemical accuracy in a reasonable amount of time? So what do they find? So um, you can find their, uh, their results in this paper that was published about a year ago in PRR. Uh, and the main question this focused on was how long does just one uh, chemically accurate energy est estimation cost in VQE? You can think of it as VQE, you're searching through a landscape, you're evaluating this cost function. Each cost function evaluation requires you know, many samples on the quantum computer. Um, you know, is that sample number prohibitive? So, um, yeah, what they did was take a uh, representative set of molecules, um, apply many different optimization techniques to try to crank down the number of, you know, uh, samples that would have to be required. Um, you know, making sure that these were, like, you know, well-developed uh, molecules, choosing appropriate basis sets and active spaces. Um, I think they spent, you know, almost 100K of AWS compute just carrying out these simulations, preparing these molecules. And um, what did they find? So this is a column that shows for each of these molecules, uh, you know, just look at the far right column, an estimate of how many days it would take of, you know, repeatedly just running, you know, taking these samples to estimate uh, one cost function evaluation. So as you can see, unfortunately, this number uh, is quite high. Um, and you know, this presents a challenge for VQE being a viable uh, path to solving ground state energy estimation. So it has this high measurement cost. Um, this doesn't even include the difficulty of carrying out this classical optimization or this challenge of how expressive these low depth onsatses can be. Um, and you know this really this really doesn't include the fact that you know if you really want to imp implement larger versions of VQE you would probably want to oh my gosh <laughs> okay uh, in the interest of time let's stop beating up on VQE and uh, get to the get to the next part so yeah so even uh, applying some techniques to you know speed up this estimation component you know using some degree of amplitude amplification. This, this didn't uh, turn out to um, get these runtimes sufficiently low. Um, okay, but all this said, I, I still believe that there is some possible future for VQE um, in that you know, it could be the case that this will, will be an invaluable state preparation heuristic in the future, or AKA like a guide state you know, needed when the Hartree-Fox state has small overlap. So it might be like kind of like a, a, you know, a booster for um, some uh, ground state energy estimation that's applied on, on top. Um, and maybe some of you heard about this. Uh, I think Katarina gave uh, you know, a, a presentation last week on this. It was some work um, that we did together over the past year. Okay, so, um, right, given that QPE seems far away, BQE uh, seems insufficient on its own, um, and given that there's such a large gap between these, you know, I think this leaves a lot of space for this, you know, might call it like a revolution zone, uh, coming up with methods that, uh, you know, have fewer operations per circuit and therefore uh, can tolerate higher error rates per operation um, that can still solve practical problems. And so in this pursuit of the first useful quantum algorithms, um, you know, 
I've been interested in exploring what could be done in this regime. Okay. So, okay, if not QPE or VQE, what might these first useful quantum computations be? So some principles behind this are, well, okay, one, which has been mentioned before, you know, in any regime it seems useful to you know, reduce the number of qubits, logical qubits used, especially if it doesn't come at the cost of anything else. Okay. Um, but beyond this, um, you know, one thing that can be done is to try, try to reduce the number of operations uh, per circuit that the algorithm requires. Um, and also we can try to increase the robustness of the circuit to error, you know, show that it can tolerate more, um, more errors uh, per circuit. These are two you know, ways to move points down into this revolution zone. Um, so there's been quite, oh, but you know, we might be okay with paying an increase in the number of circuit repetitions. Um, so this might be a cost that we have to pay or a balance that we try to navigate or optimize. So, so there's been quite a lot of work in this direction. Um, I think one of the, the first, as far as I know, was this uh, proposal by River Lane folks called Accelerated VQE. Um, this uh, gave us some inspiration to try to develop a robust version of this algorithm. It can tolerate some, uh, some degree of uh, error. And since then, there have been quite a few other um, works in this direction, uh, some of which I think we've been learning about this, uh, this week. So these have, you know, I think some of these early papers didn't use this terminology, but uh, in many recent papers, these kinds of algorithms have been dubbed early fault tolerant, uh, algorithms for early fault tolerant quantum computers. You know, so I think a lot of people have this, you know, first useful uh, quantum computation in mind where you might be you know, eking out uh, quantum advantage, you know, pushing fault tolerant uh, protocols to their limits. Okay. And so, you know, really it's this thread of research that I'm excited about for you know, pushing methods into this revolution zone. Okay, so there have been uh, a number of such algorithms proposed, um, you know, for another, a number of different applications. Um, okay, you might nitpick and say like, hey, you know, these are, you know, for all intents and purposes, like kind of solving the same task, but okay, uh, this makes it look more impressive. Um, yeah, and we've been contributing a number of, of works here, and I think you'll recognize many of the names on this, um, on this slide, people in the audience. So I, I like to think of this as a very active research area. So I just want to focus on one, for example. Um, you know, I know my talk hasn't been very technical so far, so I just want to give, you know, for maybe the, the mathematicians in the audience hungry for some, you know, understanding some technical things. I, I want to give a sense for how some of these ground state energy estimation algorithms work. So first, a point of comparison. Um, we've already heard quite a bit about QPE, um, but I'll say maybe this is a slightly different angle. Um, so the task is, given some specification of a Hamiltonian, you are to estimate the smallest eigenvalue to within some target accuracy with some confidence. Um, so a character that keeps showing up for this algorithm is uh, what you might call the autocorrelation function. This is really you know, taking your uh, input state or guide state, evolving it under the Hamiltonian. What's the overlap uh, with the input state? And I think you know, as Lexing mentioned, this encodes information about the Hamiltonian, uh, this function. So uh, how does QPE make use of this autocorrelation function? So yeah, one way to picture this is that QPE imprints this autocorrelation function um, into uh, amplitudes of uh, different ancilla basis states. And then it uses the Fourier transform um, to then uh, take a sample from the Fourier spectrum, or discretized Fourier spectrum of this autocorrelation function. So this is a um, a pretty crappy little uh, graph of the spectrum and you know you picture that you know QPE gives you a sample according to this probability distribution and then you know you can imagine um, what an algorithm might be to try to estimate the lowest energy 
given access to those samples. Okay. Um, yeah, as has been pointed out, you know, this uses a lot of ancillas. Okay, there are some, you know, a number of techniques to uh, reduce the number of ancilla qubits. Um, but yeah, generally this uses many operations as we showed earlier. So the question is, you know, to pull this down into the revolution zone, how can we reduce the number of uh, quantum resources that this algorithm requires? So um, one inspiration for this um, was an alternative to uh, using QPE for ground state energy estimation, um, introduced by Lin and Tong a, a few years ago. Um, so let me just say a little bit about uh, this algorithm. Um, you know, so similar to Kitaev, uh, it's using just this Hadamard test with uh, time evolution for different times. Um, you know, I should give Rolando a little credit. You know, he was proposing some, some similar related ideas back when, you know, he didn't know about the circuit model. Um, you know, how to draw circuit model diagrams. I don't really know what those are. Um, and so, okay, the, the keys behind these methods are that, one, the measurement probabilities, you know, these coin flips, um, these encode the autocorrelation function um, in this way. Um, and then two, so I'm going to use an example where, okay, there's only, you know, one, um, you know, the spectrum only has one eigenphase, okay? So two, use some classical post-processing to, you know, take these samples and then come up with an estimate. Um, and I kind of like to think of this as like, you know, you're hearing uh, a very noisy signal and you're trying to, you know, pick out, you know, what's the clearest hum in the signal. And so, you know, picturing the blue to be the underlying signal with some frequency, you know, we, we sampled this autocorrelation function for many different times. We have, you know, a very bad estimate of what this signal is. Uh, but remarkably, even if we have a pretty bad estimate, you know, it's hard to look at the green dots and pick out what the, what the blue frequency is. Um, but, you know, maybe some of the applied math people are like, ah, take the Fourier transform. Come on, take the Fourier transform. Yeah, so if you take the Fourier transform, you get something that looks a lot nicer. You know, there's kind of a, a nice no, a noise floor, but then there's one place where it spikes. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe our ears do something similar. That's how we can hear, I don't know. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the point is that this can be fairly robust to uh, statistical noise. You can still pick out this, um, this frequency. Okay, so this is not exactly uh, what they analyze in the Lin and Tong work. They do something a little more sophisticated, which, you know, is uh, better suited to pick out the ground state energy, you know, when there are multiple spikes in the spectrum. Um, and so what they do is they post-process, they, they actually sample, um, you know, uh, you know, they do some kind of like, you know, weighting of which times do I choose. And then they cl classically post-process in a slightly different way, which is they, um, you know, convolve uh, the spectrum with a step function. And they, you know, the algorithm uh, or the estimate is, you know, the first place that the, um, the uh, um, cumulative distribution function steps up. Okay. So this does, you know, push us slightly towards this EFTQC or this, uh, you know, revolution zone. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really not reducing the number of operations per circuit too significantly. And so, um, you know, we were interested in developing a method which could, you know, pull you uh, deeper into this, potentially uh, willing to compromise on the runtime of the algorithm. Um, so, you know, we put out this work uh, about, a, about a year ago. Um, uh, we were excited to have this accepted at QC TIP this past year. Uh, we call this method Gaussian filtering. Um, and, you know, there's a sense in which it gives, no, not the sense in which, this gives an exponential uh, improvement in the dependence of the number of operations um, per circuit on the precision. Okay, so how does this work? So the key idea is to sacrifice um, the resolution in you know, resolving that, uh, um, the autocorrelation function. Um, 
you know, basically like not choosing to look at the signal for as long of times. And I think people are familiar with the idea that this will cause a, a broadening in the peaks, right? And so, um, you know, if you're willing to pay more um, circuit repetitions, then this can reduce the number of operations per circuit to now, uh, uh, to be less. Okay, how much less? Well, you can think that you're allowed to broaden the peak uh, until it starts interfering with the first excited state. Um, so this is what leads to, you know, at least for our method, we can show that it can reduce the number of operations to so one over the gap. And that's compared to one over epsilon. Um, okay, and a nice feature about this is, right, it's not just like, hey, now you have to pay this much larger cost. It actually allows for a smooth interpolation. So you can choose a, you know, a spectrum of algorithms between this, you know, circuit uh, uh, depth of one, one over epsilon and one over delta. You can picture maybe this is to suit the uh, limitations of the given hardware. Okay. Here. So, Roland. Not only I don't know how to draw circuits, but I cannot read also the, uh, what, what, what are you learning uh, there? Sorry, uh, what? Well, it's hard for me to read what, it, what you're putting there. Okay. okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll just say a little bit about, uh, you know, how this algorithm is working. Um, and, oh, wow. Oh, no. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so what's going on under the hood is basically we just choose to uh, post-process um, the estimate of the autocorrelation function um, in a different way. And so, you know, instead of convolving with this step function, uh, we convolve with a, okay, a Gaussian derivative function. And the output is an estimate of the, uh, the location of this crossing. But an important requirement is that we have ahead of time some very coarse estimate of the location of the ground state. Um, and you know, the estimate has to get us to within, um, within delta of the, um, of the ground state energy. Yeah. Is it correct to say that your improvement is in the post-processing part? Um, well, yeah, two ways, right? So it's first, thanks, Steve. First, using shorter depth circuits, uh, but then, you know, so that's not the post-processing. But then, you know, there's also a, a uh, you know, how do you choose to post-process? Maybe I'll just make a comment, which is, right, with a lot of these methods, um, you know, we're trying to make analytic statements. And so we make compromises in the performance of the algorithm in order to, you know, push through the analysis. Um, maybe I'll make this point later, but I think there's a lot of room for coming up with really good, um, maybe heuristic methods, or you know, showing how the scaling works in practice. Um, yeah. So I vaguely remember from the talk, there's a size of very limited scaling. And it seemed like this, was it this one over epsilon? Like, wasn't that the best possible scaling you could get? So I don't know how. Ah, OK. So really good, really good question. So, the Heisenberg limit scaling is, you know, the best uh, scaling that you can get for how does the runtime depend on the precision. So here, this is just showing how the number of operations per one circuit depend on the precision. So uh, in order to, you know, in, in the case of the lowest circuit depth, uh, to get the runtime, you would have to multiply this by a factor of like order one over epsilon squared. So you totally lose the Heisenberg limited scaling as worse scaling. The runtime is worse scaling in epsilon. Yeah. It's a bit of a stupid question, but how do you estimate the gap so that you can determine the depth? Because that's a hard part. You can you convince these people to come up with good numerical methods to, to do that. That's a, yeah. This is a this is very important. Estimating the gap, estimating the ground state overlap. These are all. Those are all inputs to all of these algorithms. And what happens if you don't guess correctly? Um, okay, 
Yeah, that's a, okay. Good question. So if you don't, if you don't uh, guess correctly, so it, it turns out you really just need a um, a lower bound on the gap if you you know believe the gap or let, let's see. Uh, um, so if you you know if you assume that the gap is um, you know smaller than it actually is, then you know you end up just paying additional costs, and it's like hey, you didn't need to you know. Is there a risk that you, for example, instead of uh, determining with uh, E zero and E one, you determine between E zero and E two, or something like that? I didn't. Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, that uh, if you look at the integration, basically you're, you're squishing it and forgetting E one and going to E two uh, directly. Is that not uh, a risk? If you misestimate the gap. So you're saying, like, um, you know, if you think that the gap is larger than it actually is. Uh, no, smaller. So let's say you, you take a gap that's smaller that, uh, than uh, uh, it actually is. So that means that you don't see E1. So you have this between E0 and E1. Yeah, but, uh, so if we misguess the gap and basically we overshoot, does do we not uh, see only E2 and not see E1? Um. Okay, I think I don't really understand the question, but uh, let, let's talk about it after. I'm I'm running out of time a bit. Um, okay, thanks, D. Maybe I'll take just two two more minutes. Okay, so yeah, as I promised, I wanted to outline just a few opportunities for um, places to make progress. Um, yeah, but yeah, since this work, there's been a number of um, uh, you know uh, related works going on. Um, basically, all of these are done by. People in this in this audience, um, yeah. This one was exciting. It's uh, uh, a way to use the quantum computer as a rejection sampler in ground state energy estimation. Okay, so um, carrying out some resource estimates, we can show that this method actually pulls us, you know, into the uh, into the um, revolution zone. Um, but you know, this comes at the cost. And this is, I guess, to you know, the question that Ahmed brought up of an increase in the number of circuit repetitions. And so there's a question of, are you willing to pay that to solve um, you know, whatever problem you have? OK, it should be pointed out that those circuit repetitions, in principle, could be parallel, parallelized. You know, if IBM builds their you know, center of quantum computers, you, know, you could run these in parallel. Um, and there's a question of, like, with these you know, many other uh, proposals coming out, where do these lie in this region? And so I think as a community, it will be good for us to get a sense for where uh, each of these, how each of these different methods compare with one another. OK, there's work to do. I'm going to kind of zip through these because I don't have a lot of time here. Um, opportunity one is to develop new GSEE methods. Even in just the past year, there have been a ton of approaches that have been um, developed. Um, and I think it's important to understand which are, are most promising. And I think there are a lot of methods from applied math that can be used to, you know, uh, make the performance of these even better. So, sorry, what does GSEE stand for? Oh, GSEE stands for Ground State Energy Estimation. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, as has been pointed out, uh, state preparation is an important component of this. You want, you know, it's, uh, you want that the lowest hum to have, you know, loud uh, signal in order to uh, detect it. Um, yeah, there are some methods that can prepare the uh, ground state with this cost. Interesting note is that these low depth ground state energy estimation methods actually have the same scaling. Um, yeah, and I think there's hope for uh, some coming up with some heuristic state preparation methods. Um, we'll hear from Lynn, I guess, tomorrow about some state preparation methods he's been helping. Um, this is a very important direction, improving the way that we encode the Hamiltonian onto the quantum computer. I think the importance of this extends beyond quantum chemistry to you know, differential equations or like quantum dynamics. Um, yeah, very important. You know, maybe one of the more, more important. Saving the most important for last. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll hear from Christian about some uh, methods for doing this. Important thing here is to try to exploit structure in those problems in order to reduce costs. Um, I want to make a... a, a a plug while also saying uh, another opportunity is to build software that helps us navigate this you know, very rugged landscape. So for the past year and a half, I've been um, 
uh, leading a team in this DARPA quantum benchmarking program, has some great collaborators. Uh, we built this package for resource estimation called BenchQ, um, carried out some resource estimates for these low depth ground state energy estimation um, algorithms. For those interested, you can pip install BenchQ. Um, and then so last and most importantly, I think, is to develop use cases um, for these algorithms, to find good targets so that you know, as we're developing algorithms, we know what we should be aiming for and we can use those to you know, separate the performance of different methods for developing. Uh, this is very hard, of course. You have to find things that are at the intersection of useful, classically hard, and quantum easy. Um, so this is a very interdisciplinary uh, effort. But I think you know, the thing that's going to make or break quantum computing, well, I don't know. But there are many things that, that could. Um, OK, last point I'll make on this one is in, in this uh, pursuit of developing use cases, um, you know, we talked about this last night at dinner. I think it's important that we don't just you know, look under the lamppost. You know, I think the last you know, many decades of quantum chemistry, for example, have, has carved out a groove of the problems that are deemed important, but you know, that's informed by the computational tools that we've had. So I think you know, with new computational tools, it's important to you know, rethink what might be important, what might we be able to solve. So important to look outside of this. Uh, lamp post. Okay, with that, maybe I have a few minutes for questions. And yeah, huge thanks to all of the collaborators. Um, yeah, it's happy to see that many uh, of the former Zapata interns are now long-term fellows in this program. Uh, so chat with them; they're awesome. Um, yeah, happy to take some questions. <laughs>